Hi, everybody. You're listening to the Songwriters Across Texas podcast, where you get to know musicians through their stories, and we introduce you to their music. I'm your host, Carl Anderson. We're broadcasting today from Bar 620 in Lakeway, Texas, and Beaver Nelson will be our guest. Beaver Nelson gravitated from Houston, Texas to Austin, Texas in 1989 and immediately fell in with the songwriting community. By 1992, he was running the legendary Chicago House Open Mic Nights. Today, he can be found every Saturday at the Continental Club Gallery from 8.30 to 10. Beaver Nelson is our guest today. Welcome, Beaver. Well, Mama told me no. Daddy told me so. Said that way only goes to tide it. told me no yes and daddy told me so he said watch out for the snow clouds don't rest so I put on my working pants grab my shovel for the dance said the secret of the chance it's long Beaver Nelson, thanks for coming out. Uh, Gonna get that guitar yeah, off of there. That's all right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm being attacked. <laughs> I have been give him a little hand. Attacked it's all right. By incompetence. Well, there the we guitars all have right. a mind of their own with those straps sometimes. Well, you know. There we go. I hope. I hope my kids get to see that. <laughs> you wrestling around with the strap? Yeah. They'll be most proud. <laughs> what? Uh, how are you today? I'm doing all right. Good. Doing all right. Good. You? I'm fine, thanks. Yes. Uh, you said that you wrote that song uh, just a few years ago. That was probably that was actually my middle period. That the was middle. probably <laughs> that was that came out on a record 
2002, 2002 or three, somewhere right. in there. Yep. yep. And written right around then. Right. That we, I, in, in the introduction, I let folks know that you, you came, uh, up to, you started coming up to Austin, in, in about 1989, uh, from Houston with music. And, and I'd like to get those words from your mouth and not mine. I had a friend who's several years older, uh, than I am, uh, from uh, summer camp, and he was playing. Uh, he was he. He lived here. He was like I said, several years older, and he um, he was already playing around. And uh, I would come up and stay with him well, during high school. I would come up like spring break or something like that, and I would stay with him, and he would take me around and uh, to all the open mics. So by the time I moved here. So I started doing that when I was like 16 or something. So by the time I moved here, I knew, I knew people at the open mics at least, you know. How many, so, how many open mics were there back then? A lot, yeah. Well, there were a number of them. The 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 the, the main three that that I knew of. There was one, obviously, the Chicago House. Cactus had one as well. Mm -hmm. And then there was also one at a restaurant. It's called the Colorado Street Cafe. It's not there anymore, mm -hmm. but it's it's on Colorado. Yeah, I know it. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, I remember it. And it it wasn't like a. I don't think it was a music venue. I don't recall it being like a stage as as much as like part of the restaurant a few nights a week. You know, had had music and you know open mics. I mean, they're they're great for those scenes because. You get lots of people going in, you know, to play there. So at least if you're selling drinks to just the many, many musicians. Right, you know, right exactly. You know, it's better than a, Let a, them play. a dead night, you know, uh, for, for a place. The, so, so we would, so those are the three that I, those are the three I hit before I moved to town. The Chicago house was the legendary, you know, so many people, uh, Jimmy Lafave, uh, Scrappy Judd Newcomb, Troy Campbell. Well, these are all people I met, you know, in that room. So Peg and Glenda owned it and and ran it, and um, and they. I I went with my friend, and you know he introduced me around and stuff. But over the course of I, I you know most of it, I can't remember whether. Um, I couldn't tell you which year it was. Probably when I met some of the people, but. So many of them I met just almost immediately. Some of them, bef you know, like I said, before I even moved to Austin. Right. Um, but, I mean, just the list of songwriters. It's actually Jimmy Lafave's uh, slot uh, hosting that, that I took over. When, he, when right. he got busy and was playing a lot more often and touring more often, I took his spot. Um, uh, but so there's Jimmy um, and uh, Barb Donovan Betty, Betty Elders. I met Slade Cleves there. Fracasso, Michael Fracasso. Mm -hmm. um, I met uh, Troy Campbell and uh, Judd Newcomb. I met, um, I mean, the list is so long, and I, I, w I won't name everybody, but I met um, David Rodriguez. Um, You're talking yeah, about. I, I met, uh, yeah, it's just so many. Well, Guy Forsyth. But you're, Ar, his partner, like already at the time. I mean, it's just so many. Kevin Gant. They made a movie Kevin, about him. Yeah. I mean, it, it it was just it was upstairs and downstairs. They had there were so many people coming that that they opened up the upstairs, and so on Mondays and Wednesdays they had open mics going from like eight to midnight, upstairs and downstairs at the same time. Right. So people were just going back up and up and down to, you know, you'd find out you'd call in at whatever time and get your, get your slot. You get in a lot of practice in front of folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, for sure. And, and try out new songs. You're right. There's one thing that was interesting when you're a young songwriter, it's all new to you. So you're really excited. You know, I was coming in with a new song, you know, every week almost, it mm -hmm. seemed like you'd, you'd have, probably have time for three songs. After a while, you realize a lot of these people are playing they have five songs and they're playing <laughs> or 10 they didn't get and they're playing that. three of them, you know, right. kind of over and over. Right. But when, when you're, uh, when you're 18 or 
17 or whatever. You don't know that. And, um, but you're knocked out by all the, all the different ways of, you know, presenting a song. And so, um, at its best, open mics are a great place for, for people to try out new material and, and other people just to, I don't know. Wasn't there a kind of though? Okay, I got a sense of uh, the sense of that everybody was uh, sort of making one. You wanted to be better because the person, the other people were writing killer songs too, right? Oh, yeah. So everyone was inspiring each other to raise their own bars, and there were a lot of record deals that came out of those rooms. Yeah, I don't know how ma- I don't know how many. I don't know how many like record execs were at were at the. No, that's not at, what I mean. I know, I know what you mean, but right. but so many of those, all those people I mentioned were people who, who made records at, and on f- someone's label. You know, I mean, and still have careers. A yeah, lot of a lot of them for sure. Yeah, I mean, yes. Then I also met a lot of musicians like really early on. I played a. I, I one of the things that happened to me while playing. The Chicago house was I, before I even moved to Austin. I met Troy and Judd, and uh, uh, Troy Campbell just came up to me after an open mic and he said, "Like, hey, um, you know, I got this gig down the street, and in about you know six weeks, you know, I, do you want to play it? I can you pay you whatever it was. It was twenty five dollars or something like that." And I, I I didn't even live in Austin at the time. I lived up in San Saba. That's another story. I, it was something I just did for about four months before I moved to Austin. I always knew I was coming here after high school, but I had something I wanted to do first. And so I did that, but I was coming down maybe every other week and playing open mic. So I met Troy and Judd then. And uh, so I got a gig playing at a, a, a place called El Chino that was on 6th. And that night I met, so Troy had like maybe like five different songwriters like playing a thing he was really smart about putting like scenes together and getting people together um but i met i met i met jimmy dale gilmore that night i met chris mckay i met rich brotherton um uh i'd met joe ely at 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 the uh the chicago house right before that a guy named Robbie Jacks. Um, there's so many like great players. So th- those two things, like very very quickly. So before I even moved to town, like I knew, <laughs> right? I knew the songwriters in town, and so when I moved here, you know, I just fell in with. That's who I right. fell in with. They were. What your are y'all people. doing? You know. Right. I love to, I'm going to go back to something we talked about um, when we were making your TV show episode, uh, Towns Van Zandt, is, and you would write him letters, and you showed me one that he wrote back, and I, I'd just like to hear you tell people that how you, you pursued him and how, what he gave you. Well, I, again, from summer camp, I, I was introduced to his stuff. So between him and him and he and Dylan were like they were the guys and Dylan was like everyone knew and Towns was kind of like you know your secret or whatever mm-hmm. especially at that point but he was a guy you could walk in you know a room an eighth the size of the one we're in and sit down and watch him play and so I it like with the gumption that only you know a a very young person can have I, I I um I yeah I would I would I would write him I a couple times I I I made like cassettes of songs and like sent them to him and I mean I don't but then every once in a while I'd get something back in the mail and the school I went to there was actually there were some kids there whose mother worked at the school and her husband might have been like Towns' brother. Yeah, there were some Van Zants at this. Yeah. And I got you. Um uh so there were people who found out that I was a big fan of him and they like they were his and so 
some ex- some communication went like that way, uh-huh. and some was just. But they weren't the fans that really spent, that, helped that you, were right. on that side of the the. You know, I mean, I think he was mentioned in several songs. You know, uh-huh. uh huh. But yeah, I had like some pictures that he would send me or a songbook. You know, with the signature on it, and like to Beaver, you know, good luck and blah blah. blah. Yeah, (laughs) no, it's bizarre. That gave me the chills when I saw it when you showed it to me because it was so it's so generous of you know of an artist like you know to to be like oh I got a letter here, yeah, anything I can do to encourage a young man, you know, sweet. He was really good with whatever else he couldn't remember. Uh, He did. He was very good with remembering people's names, uh-huh. and he was, he was very nice. Uh, he was just, he was always nice to me, you know. I mean, you, you can't say like you really, especially being that much younger. It's, it's not like I got to know town. Sure, you know. But you get to carry on a tradition. Do you yeah. get it like that? Because I do. I mean, I think you know. I hear people telling me about the '80s here, you know, and uh, what it was like. Uh, how the musicians gathered, uh, and we were the next generation, right? Yeah, sure. And as far, I mean, as far as like you know, carrying on the tradition or whatever, I, I still I yeah, so I like you mentioned, I play the Continental Gallery every Saturday, and yeah, halfway through the show, I do a different town song. Nice. So you know, it's up into the '40s the number of songs I've I've pulled off and some better than others but cool but i always i always do one right in the middle and um yeah just that's great it's a thing it's a <laughs> segment it's a segment it's a segment now we're doing the town's been segment uh, town's time great uh hey can we hear another song sure absolutely all right yeah. this is a fairly new one yes yeah it's called a, a friend from out of town It'll be the first, the first song on, on my new record. Sorry to call so late, I hope that she don't mind, but I'm rolling through and feeling great and thought I'd drop a line. If you got a minute, come meet me at the hideout. We'll get all up in it, yeah, we'll get it figured out. I will remember where we fit, laugh until the sun is split. We'll remember half of it, the rest will get washed down. What's better than the sound of a friend from out of town? Keep driving all alone and I'll work until it dawn. White line next time I warn you or I won't. I can't say that I won't blame you if you just cannot indulge. The thought this way I came to believe in life would budge. So I'll face the microphone. In the town you call your own Within walls that seem like home Once the sun goes down Making the lonely sounds Of a friend from out of town I might have overstated things But you used to me that way I'll laugh and smile and wink and sing that you spoke yes it will assist me for years and loops unbroken till I make it back around spiral up chips down eyes flash treasure found deep beneath the ground the ghosts will dance around a friend from out of town yeah the ghosts will dance around a friend from out of town. Thank you. 
Yeah. I love that song. Thank you. Um, That's definitely from that, from that, uh, from that tradition of which we were just speaking. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think too that it, it, it it's, uh, it makes me, it makes me think a little bit of like traffic. Uh, Stevie Winwood, uh, that John Barleycorn. That it has a similar feeling or sen- sentiment or something I don't know hmm. that I love. I've listened to that record a million times, but it's it's evocative and it's a little haunting, maybe. Yeah. The ghosts will dance around. The ghosts will dance around. <laughs> I guess I got it. Anyway, uh, Beaver Nelson is in the house. Um, hey man, these mics are sensitive. They are. <laughs> Let's uh, talk about your uh, songwriting process. Um, you you have uh, a file system. That yeah, it used to just exist in in a young man's head, <laughs> you know. But I, I there are, there are um, g- getting into the subject matter through through r- ruling out. <laughs> certain uh, uh, ways of writing. There are the people, you know, the 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 write every day, write what you know. Um, school. Um, I think, in fact, that I heard that that couplet specifically um, from Robert Robert Earl Keen. Um, I think I think that was him. It was write every day, write what you know, um, mm-hmm. and that certainly has worked for him, and um, and he's a very good writer. Um, and I might could have used more of that. There are time periods uh, when I, um, if I haven't written for a while, if you know, waiting on some spark of inspiration hasn't, you know, I look up and like, well, it's been eight months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huh. Um, it you know when I get into those periods of time, then I do. I'll pick a short period of time and make myself right. Mm-hmm. Um, and usually that opens things up. Um, but um, I've never been, I've never been disciplined in that way. Uh, the steady kind of way in writing. The discipline I did have for a long, long time was that if I had an idea, um, I immediately stopped everything. It did not matter. It didn't matter what it was. I stopped and I wrote. Then life gets more complicated and you can't, you can't keep doing that. Um, and that's when, that's when the, the more figurative, the, the, the ephemeral files, you know, in, in my own head when, when they started having to become more, more concrete. Like, I mean, it's not that I never wrote anything down earlier. It's just that, uh, you know, I might write a you know a, a phrase on a napkin or something, and then, or I might have like a passing you know a guitar figure or something like that, and then, but I could remember it all, all the different ones I had that were still in progress. Mm-hmm. But you just get older, and there's there's more stuff that didn't get finished, and pieces and stuff, and you would lose stuff, and um, you lost less when you would force yourself to immediately write any time any sort of idea came to you. Um, but you got that accordion box out to yeah, help yeah. you. <laughs> For sure, yeah. <laughs> and I just started dropping dropping notes or chord progressions and files. And then sometimes you would realize that some piece of music actually matched up with, with, um, with, with some words, um, you know, that they had the right cadence and that they felt they felt that they they fit properly and then you had the function and the form yeah exactly um and that that's that's a lot of it i didn't i didn't want to write especially as a younger writer i didn't i never wanted to write like all the lyrics before i knew how the song went um and i didn't want to write out a big piece of music if i didn't know what it was about um so I would just write just enough of either mm-hmm. until I knew what it was. 
and then I would just try to capture it very, very quickly. Um, that, and that's, that always, that usually produced the best stuff for me. Mm-hmm. Trying to just capture something that the lightning strike. Yeah. Where you could see it. But I mean, the lightning, you know, the clouds had to move in and you, you know, right. You the had start, to have yeah. all this stuff had to happen for the lightning to strike. Right. So there's yes. a ton of work that went into it before, but when the lightning struck, you know, it seems like you just you, came you, up with you, it in one second. Exactly. You catch it or you don't, but right. it's all that other work that, that makes it, you know, it made it possible. So. What in God's name is that? Hmm? Oh, that, that's Randy. He's, oh. Randy. yeah, he's Randy. He's, 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 he's dragging di- some he's trash breaking cans dishes. across. He just like he likes to do that. When I... So the songs get, they get further developed uh, uh, at the residencies. You've got this residency now at the Continental uh, Club Gallery. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So you know when I first started playing, it was a guy and a guitar, and I had to, you know, I had to, I had to strip down everything I was listening to. Um, I had to throw out a lot of stuff that actually later I, I was able to reclaim um, uh, listening to, but I had to get rid of everything that was that that was outside of it, in, in my mind was the just the essence of a song, um, and so it, playing the open mics, and then I began you know. Then as I would play out and I would get gigs and then I, then I would play with bands and I was playing with just just great, great players almost immediately. You know, I was just playing with Rich Brotherton and Don Harvey and and George Reef and Scrappy Judd Newcomb and Bucca Allen and Mark Patterson. And, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, that uh, I'm I'm dropping names, but I mean, I, I'm forgetting names as well as mentioning great players. Right. Um, but like that all happened like so very fast that like a year after taking over the, op- the Chicago house open mic, I had to let that go. Cause I was playing, I was playing the black cat every Wednesday night. You play from 11, 11 PM to 2 AM. That was, that was the only, they wouldn't open the door until 11 PM. Right. Um, you play three hours with no breaks and then, and that was it. And so there were all kinds of great songwriters that like Walter Traggart would always come down. Bruce Robeson would come down and it was always great to be able to hand the guitar off. And, right. and, and so you, you could be, you know, but that uh, was one of the best gigs that you could get. Oh, it was fantastic. And I mean, and so, but like that thing, that was like, that was almost made to order all those players. They, they understood the the overall um the framework of the music i was playing like way better than i did um and so i could walk in and and play a song at at a rehearsal and walk out and come back in 10 minutes later and then we play the song start to finish they 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 already they knew they had all the vocabulary that i didn't have right and so so we were doing that. And then within like a couple of years, like in between that and like two and a half years later, I had had and lost two major label record deals. Wow. So by my 22nd birthday, on me and my wife's 22nd birthday, I got dropped from my second major <laughs> label deal. And then I went and then I, I was, then I immediately put another band together and then immediately put another band together. Um, and I would, you know, I would travel, I'd tour some with like no tour support, no album, no merch at all. Four guys in a Jeep Cherokee driving around, you know, playing for a hundred bucks a night. I mean, just not a great plan career wise. Um, uh, but definitely something I had to get out of me. Um, and then, then Towns died and I realized I hadn't played, I hadn't played solo shows in a really long time, like a really long time. And I realized that I had songs that I was playing 
in my band that I could not play by myself. They weren't those sorts of songs. And so that's when I, I had to, I had to refocus and then I had to, I had to integrate that where I had to be able to play. I had to be able to play a song by myself. Um, and in a way that st communicated well, like the essence of the song to another human being. But then I had to be able to integrate that with getting to play with really great players. And so, and that's when, that's when Matt Eske came along and said, hey, you know, it's been quite a while. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's maybe time for the world to get a Beaver Nelson record. Right. Matt Eske ran. Uh, Freedom Records, Freedom yeah. Freedom Records, Exactly. Yeah. And so, so we, we made, we made, we made a record there and that was, I think that one came out in 98, um, 97, 98, like right in there. And, um, and so f from there, I, 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 I was making, uh, yeah, I was making records that were, that were like charting on like Americana charts and that kind of thing and like doing well. And I had a band and, uh, uh that I was traveling around with it, at various sundry times. It was scrappy and Mark Patterson and George Reef. And then sometimes then cornbread took Reef's place and Bellens mm -hmm. took over for Patterson and Patterson came back at one point and we were, we were doing that. We made like, we made three records, uh, in a row that came out, um, pretty in pretty short order and was touring a decent bit. Um, and getting put, radio play pushed. Yeah. Pushed all my chips into the, onto the table for my third record. Um, like there were some missteps along the way with, with a, a smaller label. It wasn't freedom, but it's, but a, a record that my second record came out on cause freedom kind of, they, they, they halted putting out new records for, for a short period of time. And, and so I, I went with another indie and, um, they had said all kinds of stuff that they were going to do that, that didn't get done and well, their distributor did. And so yeah, I just thought, yeah, I don't want to mess with any of this. So I'm going to, I'm going to push all my chips into the table for this third record. First record, second record, both got radio play and going well. And now I've, I really had a good record on my hands. So I was just going to, I was going to pay the publicist I was going to pay I wanted to make sure everything got done I was going to pay radio promotions and all that and that record came out on September 18th 2001 and um by the time which is you know not anywhere near the great tragedy of the era right. um but just on a personal level it it was it was the last time that that I tried something, <clears throat> excuse me, tried something like that. Um, and taking a band around the country to tour, we did tour that record. Um, uh, and we did okay. Um, driving after nine one one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we played New York city at maybe six weeks after you could still smell burning plastic. You know, I mean, it, it was, it, it was what it was. Um, but, um, my point on that the uh, oh well i mean when that record came out but by, by the time i mean almost every radio station in the country went to like all news 24 hours a day for i don't know a month six weeks when radio stations started playing music again like ryan adams had put out a record dylan had put out a record robert earl keen had put out a record i think maybe leonard cohen had i mean right. it was like just you know Male songwriters, you know, right. more famous than you. And so all those, <laughs> all those radio stations had, they had this backlog of stuff that when they finally went to music and right. they started playing new records, well, those were the ones that were going to get played. Right. And so, so that was that. So my point being on this is that even though I continued making records that were full band records, it was around that time, the record that came out after that, that I started touring solo. Mm -hmm. And so the band shows became less and less frequent 
And over a long period of time, even though like it was, they were great players and killer players and we made really great sound of records. I, we only played, I don't know, six to eight band shows a year, Mm -hmm. sometimes four. Um, and so my songbook began getting smaller and smaller. It started shrinking, you know, when you're, when you're only playing a handful of shows a year, uh-huh. You're not whipping out all these songs left and right. Right. So the, the why, why I'm telling you all that is to say that when that eventually pared down, uh, Mike Middleton had taken over the, the, the drumming in the band. I said, <laughs> had taken over. I don't, he didn't kill anybody or anything. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> but when, when he became the drummer in the band and then it, it, everything kind of pared down, and it was almost like on a lark, like uh, Matt had to miss a run of shows. Matt Eske had to miss a run of shows. And Mike and I were like, well, let's just play them anyway. And we did. And then I realized, wait, this could be really great because I'm the only one that's got to know how the song goes. And so, so, you know, I played a few songs I hadn't played in years because I had changed keys and all that kind of stuff. And, and so... Then when, when the Continental Residency came along, it was like, okay, here's the chance now because I'm going to play 90 minutes every week and I do not want to play the same 90 minutes every week. So I was bringing in, especially like the first year I was doing it, I'd show up with three songs I hadn't played in 10 years, like every time until I had, I basically I had almost my entire song book back. Um, and so now that's, well, then COVID hit, and then, then I lost the use of my left arm for about <laughs> six months, and oh, and then no, wait, uh, that wasn't funny. That, well, I mean, it was crazy. It was just the the same week it rolled in. I had a, uh, I I played I played my Continental show upstairs. I went downstairs. I watched uh, Charlie Sexton sit in with Chuck Prophet for an hour. I went home. I got up. I read an email saying, as of tonight, the Continental Club will be closed for the foreseeable future. Um, And then by the next Friday, I couldn't move my left arm. And uh, it's just a long story, but it was a problem up in my neck and it had completely, completely shut down. It atrophied my muscles. And I thought I had like a rotator cuff problem. So I was kind of ignoring it. Um, Uh, and just figured I'd push it off until I didn't have as much going on, you know, but I can't paint houses or coach goalkeepers or play my weekly show at the Continental if I have a rotator cuff surgery. And it wasn't like I was going to make it worse doing any of those things. So I just ignored it, but it wasn't in the shoulder at all. It was up in the neck. And so everything had atrophied, then the, then the the disc herniated and I I couldn't move my arm. I mean, it was complete a hundred percent dead weight. And so, um, I got dropped off at the hospital and it was a crazy story, a long story that I won't tell here, but eventually I got worked on and, um, it, it took months and months for me to be able to bend my arm at the elbow, wow. to be able to lift it at all, like out to the side. It was, but you know, the world had shut down, so I couldn't do any of those things anyway. So, um, I rehabbed the arm like crazy. Um, my son would go work with me when, when I was able to start working again. So I could work one handed. He was furloughed from his job. So I'd work one handed and he would, he would do the stuff I couldn't do with my right. And I had about three or four months, uh, to rehab it, to get to where I could work when he, when he, uh, went off to school, um, which is what happened. I was able to, um, and so some friends were patient with some projects. They took a little longer, but um, I was able to rehab my arm. Um, and so I began writing again. Um, I didn't have the gigs, so I wasn't working on, I wasn't going to sit around and play the old songs. So I wrote an entire record, um, and I recorded it, uh, at my friend Matt Giles house, uh, who had been in one of those bands in like 95 when we were traveling around with, okay. no, with no money, right? Matty um, Giles. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a great player and a, a very good friend. I saw him this morning. Nice. Um, Matt. Yeah, and uh, so um, so we recorded that record, 
and still everything was shut down. And around when we got done with that record, then it's like, well, Continental's going to open up next month, <laughs> you know? And so then I had to, now I had to go back and relearn, you know, eight or nine albums worth of songs, you know, just the ones that had been, I had just kind of gotten a hold of, you know, so then relearned them and, and, um, and, and that's what happened. So, so here we are again, I'm just about at the point now where I've got, I've got almost got the whole song back. back and, and we never know what we're going to play uh, when, I'm, when, that's fun. when, when we stepped up to step up, when we get on, I can't even call it on stage. When we get on floor, when we get behind microphone, um, getting the batter's box. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a uh, it's wonderful, and it's a uh, it's a great place, and so it's it's really valuable. Um, you know, every show is is a is one of one, and uh, and it's. The audiences are really cool in Austin for residencies I've found over the years, you know, that it, and I've, I've always gone to them, you yeah. know, I've always known people that were in one and then sure. I've seen a bunch of shows. Um, I, it, but they, what always amazes me is the, the variety you get that it's never the same with people do that. Yeah. And that takes a lot of work. Right. That takes a lot of work to not, for it to not get stale. Um, yeah, I tried a couple when I was younger, uh, when I just didn't have as, as many songs. And it's hard. It, it's hard to, for everyone to be different, you know. But uh, I also was really uncomfortable, especially on stage with the band. Um, I was not very good at talking on stage. I, was, I could do it okay when I played solo. Um, unless I was in one of those moods where you just turn in and it's all about you. But... but this is just brought it's a it's brought a different part of of me um it's forced it but it's it's more like a house concert and mm -hmm. that you're not on a stage you know mm -hmm. it's eye to eye um yeah i would put it that way you know and it's it's me and a drummer except on the odd occasion when when he's when he can't play and i play solo which you know I'm perfectly capable right. of doing right. So, and those shows are fun for different reasons too. So, we're um, we're really enjoying it. Um, I'm hoping in the in the future. Uh, I haven't nailed it down yet, but I'm hoping to record a live record. I've I've never made a live record before. Um, I tried to do one after the fact one time, um, but it it we didn't quite get the sounds that we wanted. Um, Good. I know that sounds strange to say I tried to make a live recording after the fact. I, what, it, what I mean to say is a show had been taped that I wasn't really aware of that was a particularly good performance. And we tried to we tried to we tried to make it sound right. And we, we couldn't quite get there for what would be my first and possibly only live record ever. So um, I want to take a real intentional stab at it this time nice. and record a series of shows and and uh, in the gallery. Hopefully. Yeah, exactly. Great. That's so excellent. that's my hope. I'm hoping that happens yeah. too. That's going to be good. Well, I just want to thank you a lot for coming down and, and uh, hanging out with us and, and sharing and playing music for us. What song are you going to play for us on your way out the door, Beaver? I don't know yet, but I'm going to tell you in just a second. But I do want to just a, a blanket apology to any any songwriters that, for whatever reason, that were very important to me that I didn't mention – I will say I was in a I was in a song swap uh, that went on for several years with me and Michael Fracasso and Matt the electrician and Nathan Hamilton, and um, and that was great. Uh, I also was in one with Scrappy and Adam Carroll and uh, Steve Poltz uh, for for uh, for a run of tours, and and those guys were getting to spend time and watch people being able to watch uh people write and show up with new stuff and so those are all people that even though they weren't like solo projects i was doing those were guys i spent a tremendous amount of time with and and uh think highly of great and uh, and then uh, uh another one named mike nikolai who uh, i'm a big fan of he sometimes lives here he, he moves around a lot but he's uh -huh. been here for 
off and on for over about 30 years and uh, he lives here now he's got a record store up north anyway. what's it called Is it love wheel love wheel i think that's right go check out love right. wheel i'm gonna check it out he's a great writer nice figure on pain and the occasional rain three strikes will remain never part of the game fixed in your mind at the most inopportune time traveling down your spine limbs intertwined so just do it already you know you're going to whatever you're going to do is already Again. Oh, hey, one quick shout out. Shirt. Who, who made your shirt? Oh, this is uh, by my neighbor, Rita Banninger. And uh, she, uh, she finds shirts and she, she sews things on the pockets. And uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fan. And so that's a, a Rita, Rita Banninger. Rita Banninger. Right there. She makes me shirts with chickens on it. All right. Well, it's a good looking chicken shirt. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, well, thanks again for listening. That was Beaver Nelson on Songwriters Across Texas podcast. Uh, you can see him at the Continental Gallery on Saturdays at 8.30 in Austin. And uh, if you haven't seen his TV show, the Songwriters Across Texas TV episode we made, please go to the YouTube channel and check that out. Thanks again for watching. Thanks again for watching.